What's going on my friends? I am Dustin Selzer with Electrician U and today we're going to talk about how to hang a ceiling fan. Alright, so there's tons of different ceiling fans out there. As an electrician, I have hung every kind of ceiling fan you can all the way from like the little tiny three blade uh you know like super small flat fans to like multi fans where like the whole assembly of two different fans swivels and moves around to like big ass fans that are like 13 feet in diameter that are all you know uh that require an actual like motor controller and, and like our network wired there's a ton of different things that you do so the, the big thing with ceiling fans really is they wobble if you don't do them correctly. Um, if you don't keep everything tight in a ceiling fan, it, it's a spinning thing, right? So like the more that it's spinning, the more that it has a chance to wobble. Anything that spins, vibration is, is a hugely important thing. So when they build fans, everything needs to be symmetrical and making sure that every single thing that you could possibly tighten is tight, that you don't leave anything loose because even if it doesn't show signs of not wobbling right away, if it's loose, it'll work itself free and then you'll have things wobbling. Another thing that happens a lot of time from factory is that like blades can get warped or the actual um, motor itself because of the packaging wasn't done right. It can actually, when the box is dropped, it can kind of kink. And so it naturally has a little bit of a wobble to it. But that's really the big thing with fans is controlling the wobble. A lot of fans uh, come in different types for the number of blades that they have. A lot of them are different sizes. You may have a room constraint. You may have beams in a room, like nice decorative beams. And like a 52 inch fan might hit the beam. So you've got to go into like a 48 inch fan or something like that. So the size uh, of the blades, the number of blades, all of that's going to determine how much air is moving in a room. Obviously the less blades and the slower the fan uh, rotation, the smaller the blades as well, uh, that's all gonna be less air movement, but the bigger the blades, the more number of blades, and uh, how fast that fan can spin is how much air it's gonna be able to push. So um, that's why, you know, big ass fans are generally put in like large gyms or huge factories or things like that, where you've got like massive amount of air that you need to move. The other thing to consider is the price of a fan. So if you're buying like cheap, crappy fans, you're gonna get what you pay for. If you're buying really, really high end, nice $500, $1,000 uh, fans, you're gonna get a nicer product. And generally there's less mistakes from the manufacturer with really nice fans. That's not always the case. Some really expensive fans are shitty <laughs> and you end up getting them and like half of them don't work. And you know, there's like quality assurance problems that from fans that are marketing themselves as being a high-end fan but are actually not a high-end fan but when you get fans the the more fancy ones that are all decorative and and have tons of parts and stuff generally there's like a less wobble issue with them um, but they're usually more of a pain in the ass to install whereas the cheaper fans that you get they're a lot easier to install but the chance for them wobbling or having issues is a lot greater so the first thing that i do when i install a new fan is I open the box and just see what I'm working with. Um, it, because there's so many different kinds of fans, it's a good idea to just kind of see like for the installation, are these blades even gonna work? Is this is this thing gonna work in the environment that it's in? But also in this example, I've got three different boxes for every one of the fans that I'm hanging in this house. So I wanted to open all three boxes and make sure that the light kit is actually going to fit with the fan and make sure that the blades go with the fan and everything is actually a, a working piece. I don't wanna get up there and start building it and then get 20 minutes into this job and realize I have the wrong shit. So um, just making sure that everything fits with each other and that you have all the pieces is really good idea. The next thing I do is I just take the existing fan down. Um, this house, I'm actually doing five different fans that we're changing out. So I'm just taking all of these fans, putting them in a pile in the garage. They're going to take care of them, but I need to get all that down so I can get the new bracket up. Um, some fans, you can use the old existing bracket that's in the ceiling to hang a new fan, but I just don't do that because I think 
that's not it, that's just my preference when a new fan comes with new parts i don't like taking old shit off old things to try to mix with new um i always use the new stuff out of the package i have seen people do that in the past i just don't do it i don't like to do it new stuff new fan new everything so the first thing that i do is i put the bracket up in the ceiling i like to hang fans top down meaning I hang the fan and build everything in the ceiling in place, just like I would for a chandelier as well. I don't like trying to build stuff on the ground, especially like fans, a lot of times they don't like sit straight and pretty. If you put the blades on, they end up leaning on some of the blades and then you can kind of warp the blades a little bit. And I just don't, again, we're trying to, the wobble thing is is like a really important thing. So you from, from the factory, how everything exists, I like not putting any stress or, or anything on a fan. Plus I don't like having to like manhandle a huge fan and like bring it up a ladder. I just, my method I found I am much faster doing it this way is if I go from the top and just hang everything, put all the blades in place. Um, and so that's, that's how we're gonna do this. So once I get my bracket up there and in place, I need to make sure that that bracket is solid. You don't want the bracket to wobble or move at all. Um, if it does, there's a chance that the whole fan is gonna wobble and you don't want that. So we wanna make sure that that bracket is solidly in place. And when you pull on it and yank on it, it doesn't move anywhere. All right, so what does the National Electrical Code say about ceiling fans? Um, surprisingly, not very much. There's a couple of things in like pools and spas where it's giving you elevations above water. Um, there's some things about the actual box that uh, holds a fan up. There's some stuff about the motor of the fan. So let's look at the actual box for supporting the weight of a ceiling fan. 314.27C, boxes at ceiling suspended paddle fan outlets. So an outlet box or outlet box system used as the sole support of a ceiling suspended paddle fan shall be listed, shall be marked by the manufacturer as suitable for this purpose and shall not support ceiling suspended paddle fans that weigh more than 70 pounds. So a lot of different fans that you're gonna install get hung a lot of different ways. Sometimes they have to be hung from big metal beams. Sometimes the fan's 300 damn pounds. There's a lot of like big cast iron, huge steel fans. And there's just like cheap stuff like in here. You guys don't even see, but there's actually a fan above me. I'm just really clever with my angles. So you don't see it, but it's like some cheap crappy fan, you know? So the actual box, this thing probably weighs like I don't know, 10 pounds maybe. So there's no problem with the box itself holding the weight of that fan. But if we get up to like a hundred pound fan and you've just got this little metal box with some little tiny screws holding this thing in the ceiling and you start adding circular motion, the likelihood of that fan falling out of the ceiling increases, especially if you're talking plastic boxes. If you're gonna be putting like screws into a plastic box, trying to hold a 100 pound fan, ain't happening, Kapanen. So we have to go into code to know what to do. And it says you need your boxes to actually be listed. So a lot of times you have specific fan braces. They are listed for use for suspending fans from them and holding a certain amount of weight. Sometimes you have fan cakes, which are fan rated pancakes. Same kind of thing. Can't use just a regular pancake. You have to use a fan rated pancake because it is rated for the weight of that fan. So what else does it say in here? Um, for outlet boxes or outlet box systems designed to support ceiling suspended paddle fans that weigh more more than 35 pounds, the required marking shall include the maximum weight to be supported. So if you're gonna be over 35 pound fan, which is a pretty damn heavy fan, to be honest, um, it needs to be actually listed for what the total amount of weight is that can be supported. Now there's a couple of new additions for this code. Uh, it says outlet boxes mounted in the ceilings of habitable rooms of dwelling occupancies in a location acceptable for the installation of ceiling suspended paddle fans shall comply with one of the following. One, it has to be listed for the sole support of ceiling suspended paddle fans. You can't use some box that's not listed for fans. Two, an outlet box complying with the applicable requirements of 314.27 and providing access to structural framing capability of supporting of a ceiling suspended paddle fan bracket or equivalent. So basically, use a fan box. <laughs> Don't use like some crazy old box. Don't be using plastic boxes, especially not the old work kind of boxes or like the really, really old boxes that you find in like 1960s homes and you think you can just drive a screw through it or put, you know, it's like some random screw on the, the, the ground that you found. It's really important to use stuff that is listed. 
Then I start opening up the boxes and pulling everything out. Now you have to, every fan's gonna come with everything completely disassembled in pieces, so you need to put the fan base together first. So I take the actual motor housing and put the, the uh, down rod. Most fans, if it's not a flush mount kind of fan, uh, it'll have some sort of down rod on it. You can buy longer down rods. Um, you can buy like an eight foot down rod if you want to, but getting the down rod put in place and getting the wires fished through the down rod and getting the ball in place and making sure that before you get all that in place, you get the canopy on too. And if there's any scussion rings, uh, you got to put the escussion rings on too. So you kind of get everything assembled so that you can go hang it up in place and still make your joints. Um, so from the bottom, in this case, it would be uh, getting the scussion plate on and then getting the canopy on and then putting the ball and rod through all of that so it's all assembled. And then making sure that all of the screws when I screw everything in place are tight. Um, every fan generally is gonna have a pin that goes in it, kind of a safety pin um, that uh, goes in place just in case like a screw comes loose or something like that. The safety pin actually holds the down rod through the motor assembly so that that motor's not just gonna fall out of the ceiling on you if you do loosen the screws. But there's two screws usually um, that keep everything in place and there's a safety pin in almost every fan that you're gonna hang. The next thing too is putting the wires through all of that mess can be kind of cumbersome. If you're doing like a six inch down rod, it's not gonna be that bad to fish the wires up. Usually I twist all of the wires together at the tip. It just makes it a little bit more rigid because it's it, it, the uh, the wires tend to flex while you're trying to push them through. So it can actually be a real big pain in the butt, especially if you have anything that's like 12 or 18 inches or longer. If you get an eight foot rod, you really need to get a, like a fish tape or something run all the way through that thing and then just tape the wires on and pull them through the rod. If you've got a coat hanger, like anything like that, um, to try to help you get through is super helpful. But the longer the rod, the more impossible it is to get these tiny stranded wires to actually fish through on their own with a, without a little bit of help. Then once you get all of the wires through, make sure that you cut everything to length. I like to always leave a little bit of extra slack. You don't ever wanna cut wires too short and then you're having to make joints and like stick uh, you know, butt splices or something inside of the rod. You always want to leave a little bit of extra slack. So um, I tend to like measure out whatever my rod is and then I add, you know, eight inches to a foot of extra and cut that because I can always shorten it later once I get everything hung. And in this case, we have like a, just the standard, I think it's a four inch rod that came with this thing, or maybe it's a six inch rod, I don't know, but it's a short, short rod. So I just cut like an extra 18 inches of slack. Then once I've got everything fully assembled, it's time to go hang everything on the bracket. So I go up the ladder, hang this motor in place. Now, every one of the balls that's gonna come on a fan, if you notice, there's like a little notch in the ball a little like vertical notch on one side and inside of the actual bracket itself there is a uh, this tiny little bump I guess you could say so when you twist that ball there's a certain place where that slot and that bump meet up and everything just kind of locks in place you got to make sure you do that otherwise again this fan might wobble so this thing is designed to be kind of locked and kept in one place and it kind of like drops in perfectly when you find that spot now that you've got everything in place it's time to put the module in some fans don't have modules um, they're just you know three wires you get a black white and a blue if that's the case you just hook uh, the blue is for the light kit so if you have a switch on your wall for a light and you have a switch on your wall for the motor for the uh, the fan motor then you would put whichever switch goes to the black black is typically the motor and then blue is typically the light inside the fan a lot of times they'll have a little sticker on them that says uh, two motor and then two light and then the neutral for both of them just goes to the neutral for both of them. So that's the typical like switch operated light. These are $500 fans, um, probably with the light kits and everything, they're probably around $500. Um, fancy schmancy fans, typically people aren't switching them from lights. They have like some cool little wall controller or like fancy remote that they're gonna lose in a month. Every single one of these fans has a remote that they're gonna lose in a month. Um, so this one has a module. Now, a lot of these 
fans that have modules have a whole bunch of different wires. So if you're looking at this and you're seeing why is his fan, like why do you have all of these wires? It's because I have this module that I have to stick into it and it's a remote control. So it's sending signals and it has different speed controls on it. It has power, it has light control, it has dimming. So there's a lot of like functionality to this specific fan. Um, so this module has to take a signal in and be able to do a whole bunch of different things. Uh, so this specific module also has little tiny dip switches on it, which um, the, you'll see in a minute the remote does as well. And you have to make sure that each one of the fans you hang up has a little bit different dip switch configuration. Some fans will have like four dip switches, some will have more than that. But between four different dip switches, if you put like one down and three up or two down and the other one's up or like three up and one down, it doesn't matter. But if you do every one of the fans differently, then you won't have an issue between different bedrooms turning on the other bedrooms fan that actually does happen um, so just make sure that your remote that you have matches the fan configuration that your dip switches are the same sometimes you'll have fans where it's just dip switches up in the fan and the remote just reads um, whatever that dip switch configuration is other times you'll just have something that is set from the factory and you don't have any ability to control it um, and you can do some special programming with the remotes if one fan is the power's off but the other one is on and you set it to rem like remember that program and then you shut that fan and turn this fan on and you learn with the remote you know like there's there's all kinds of crazy stuff this is why i hate fans <laughs> you, you could spend all this time and then eventually you could turn fans on you got like three different rooms of fans turned on and you're like oh my god i gotta sit and program all this crap anyways so uh once i get the module put up in place this is another very difficult part and it can be kind of frustrating it's probably the most frustrating part really is when you're trying to get a module up and there's all these wires up there and you've got like one little lead that's for the remote control it's for your rf signal um getting all of that in place so it's not smashing any wires or so uh, you can actually get the canopy fit back in place is oftentimes a huge pain in the ass. Because you left all this extra length, right? I said leave extra length. Now you can look at all the wires and be like, all right, where do I need to fold these over to get these wire nuts tucked up inside of here so that I can put the canopy up and I don't have any wires it's like smashed and hanging out um, and it's not putting any stress on the conductors. This is an art form. This is gonna take you hanging a lot of fans before you really figure this out. But once you get it all sorted, you'll notice that most modules will come with like a line side and a load side um, where the in incoming power leads are together grouped on like one side of the module. And on the other side of the module, you'll have a whole bunch of different colored wires. And this is the wires that go down into the fan. So the, the power wires are usually just gonna be like a black and a white. Um, it's a plastic module. A lot of times there's no ground with it. And the grounds that are coming, you're actually trying to ground the bracket itself and anything metal, not actually the plastic module that doesn't have any metal on it. So you'll typically just have a black and a white and that is your power. So you don't need two different switch legs. You just need power, constant power at all times. It doesn't need to be switched. If you turn off a switch and it cuts uh, power to this module, your remote's not gonna work anymore because there's not actually power going to the module, going to the fan anymore. So that's why if you have a switched fan and you're doing something on a remote, typically I will just hardwire and bypass a switch. Um, or I'll just tell the homeowners like, look, you can have this if you just like want to have a switch to be able to shut off and on, but you need to know when you turn the switch in the off position, it's gonna kill the ability for this fan to work on the remote anymore. Um, so a lot of times I'll just like hardwire the fan in so it's constant hot up there, but you take the black and white, you hook it to the line side of this module. And then on the load side, you would take all of the colorful wires and usually there's going to be those same colorful wires coming off the module as they're coming out of the fan. There should be, sometimes you don't, sometimes you have shitty manufacturers that just don't care, um, but you should just be able to go color for color for all of the, the other leads. There's gonna be different uh, fan speed controls, there's all kinds of different things. Lighting, I said like dimming earlier. Um, so that is what all of the different the colors are. And then typically you're gonna have like an antenna wire as well. So getting all of that terminated, 
with leads as short as possible, but not too short. You still need to be able to have some flexibility to move and tuck wires. So don't cut them too short, but you don't need to leave them 18 inches long anymore either. So figure out that good, uh, that good amount so you can tuck all your wires in and put your canopy up. So the next thing we're going to do is move down. Uh, we have got everything fully assembled up there so we don't have to mess with anything else above the blade level. It's like the install's done at that point. Fun fact, did you know that the number of blades on a fan actually has a purpose? There's a reason behind why some fans only have three blades and some have four, some have five, some have six, some have like 13, but there's a reason to it. So generally fans that have less blades can spin faster. So they're kind of high speed fans. They're really meant to push a lot of air and actually kind of cool a place. Not really, it's more of a perceived effect of cooling a place. So if we have more blades on a fan, the motor will operate at slower speeds and it actually reduces the noise. Whereas less blades, usually a little bit noisier and they spin faster. So it's a little bit different reason. And if you look at a lot of the really, really large industrial fans that have like 15, 20 blades, they can still cut a lot of air because it's a lot of uh, blades that are cutting, actually literally cutting the air as they spin, but they can't spin anywhere near as fast. They're a lot heavier. There's much more material to move. They're cutting more air. So there's more actual wind drag on that motor. So typically the motors that are put into these things are really expensive because just low speed motors in general are really expensive, but figured and sciencey a little bit with why they even care about fan blade number. So now what I do is assemble the blades. Some people like to, when they first open a box, put the blades and put the arms on the blades. Um, just make sure that when you put the arms and the blades together, that you make sure that the screws are tight. Um, if they come with little washers, I would use those washers. A lot of this stuff is for vibration dampening. Um, so a lot of little like rubber grommets come with some of these things. You don't wanna just throw some screws in place. This is why reading instructions, if you're new to putting fans together, is really important because every fan's different, but figuring out how to put all of those things together um, and what hardware comes with what. If you end up putting this whole thing together and you've got this extra bag of like washers that you didn't use, you need to go and take the fan blades back apart and put the washers on. Um, but anyways, so you, we're gonna put uh, in these fan kits, um, there's only three blades, so it's kind of uh, easy, but we're gonna put everything together and make sure that all of it is extremely tight. So if you have a kind of fan where there is a blade and an arm, make sure that those screws are tight, but then the whole thing, the arm and, and blade together as an assembly are gonna have more screws that you have to put into the motor housing. And those need to be tight as well. So generally what I'll do is I'll either take a drill with me and I'll have it on a low setting just so I don't have to like sit and fumble in the air holding this thing and trying to screw. I'll just use a drill and just be like bop, bop and get everything in place not firm and I'm not trying to strip out screws and put them in solidly. I'm just trying to get the, the blades in place and on. And then once I get all of the blades in place, then I'll take a flathead screwdriver because I can get a lot of torque on that. And I'll go to every single screw that I just put together and I'll just get it extremely tight and I'll check all the way around and make sure I've gotten all of the arm screws that go on the blades, as well as the entire blade assembly once it's together into the motor housing itself, just making sure all of it's tight. So you notice a theme here, right? I'm like with the canopy, it needs to be, everything needs to be tight with the down rod where it connects to the top of the motor housing. Those two screws where the pin is, those need to be super tight. The arms, super tight. I'm just gonna keep saying that because again, this is rotational motion we're talking about. Anything with rotational motion, if there's vibration, it's gonna screw with everything and start to wobble. Um, so just making sure again, that, that that's not a problem. Now these specific lights come with light kits as well. So there's an extra box, a third box with a light kit. So what you have to do with most fans, they're gonna have like a flat, uh, cover on the bottom, like a hubcap of, or something. Um, and you take that thing off and there's uh, usually a blue and a white wire on the inside of them. And that's for your light kit. So that is where a light kit would attach to it. Sometimes your little, you know, light kit is going to have a black and a white, but you have a blue and a white sticking out of the fan. It doesn't matter. The black can go with the blue and the white goes with the white. Sometimes they just mix and match manufacturers and so they don't get the same colors but a lot of times you'll have a blue and white to blue and white either way the power 
conductor, the hot conductor, um, is what you need to hook with the other one. The, the neutral just goes with the neutral. But every fan, for the most part, that has the ability to have a light kit on it is going to have this cover that you can remove. Um, so once we remove the cover, we hook up the, the light kit conductors, put the light in place, and then screw it in place, and then we just put the lens cover over it. So now we've got the entire fan fully assembled. There's no chains on these fans because they're not, again, they're not like pull chain style. These are remote style. So the last thing that we have to do is make sure that the remote works. Um, so I open up the remote, I put the new batteries that came with it in. There's two of these little flat kind of washer batteries. And then I make sure the dip switches match the dip switches that I put up there. And then I go and turn the power on. And uh, at that point, test every fan has some kind of procedure that you have to go through some fans you can literally just turn them on hit a button and it automatically responds to the remote some of them you have to like push a button for five seconds and wait for the light to blink on at you some of them you have to like mink air some of them like do this kind of dance thing where like the blades will start spinning one way and they'll start going another way and then eventually it starts to spin on its own reading instructions is key again every one of them kind of has their own procedure so if you have something with a remote read 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 and figure out what you have to do and read thoroughly don't just look for the information you're looking for and then skip through the rest because you oftentimes you're missing something really crucial and you'll sit there like why is this not working you know it's because you didn't read the whole thing now that we've got the fan turned on and we verify that the light works and that it dims it's time to give the fan a test run so usually what i do is i'll turn the fan on low speed um, just to make sure that there's no obvious wobble to it. Um, then I'll turn it on medium speed and see, because as you start to speed the fan up and there's more rotation, that wobble is gonna start to get more pronounced. So I don't ever start out at high speed. I usually start out at low, then go to medium, then go to high, make sure the light works. There's no wobble on these fans. And I'm not gonna talk about how to fix a wobble <laughs> in this video. That's a whole different video on its own. Um, a lot of fans come with an actual uh, like kit with weights on it so you can try to balance the fan so that it gets rid of the wobble but brand new fans from the factory should not have to be balanced they should everything should be straight and and, and like you know um spaced out correctly and there shouldn't be any issues out of a box if you've made sure everything is tight. So all of these fans that I put in, there was no wobble on them. Um, and that's always one of those things too. It's like, no matter how many fans you put up, the last thing that you do when you hang it up and you get that remote out is you're like, please don't wobble. Cause you spent all that time putting the damn thing together. And then you go to find out like, the actual turning mechanism was kinked from the factory and you didn't realize it. And so like, at the fan you can see the motor th housing kind of wobbling and you're like well shit that's not even my problem that's not something i did that's something from the factory so now i gotta take this whole thing back apart ship it back go get a different fan you know it, that's why i hate fans really there's nothing difficult about fans i'm just so tired of hanging fans um i've hung so many over the years but it's not all that difficult like this is how it's done most fans are this way again there's probably some of y'all out there that don't like that i hang it in place and you think hanging it on there putting it all together on the ground is the way to do it that's totally fine there's nothing wrong with that but i have raced people and you know as an electrician like you're a helper you got other helpers around and it's like I'm not letting you beat me. Like I'm gonna get more fans up than you today. And so you just figure out by doing things certain ways what's faster. And I have found me personally, hanging fans in place is the way to go. That's just the way I like it. The downside is sometimes you drop screws and you gotta go down and like figure out stuff because you're putting screws in over your head. A lot of people, the methodology when you're building it on the ground is that you don't drop screws. Like everything's right there. And then all you have to do is lift the whole fan up and hang it. I get it, totally understand. Um, it's just not my method. Hope that gave you guys something. Um, please leave some comments below if there's things that you guys do, things that you disagree with how I did them. Um, and then uh, make sure that you hit the little sub button. Please hit the sub button. Helps me out a lot. And uh, join the channel membership. If you're not a member already, all these people over here are, they get their names on screen. <laughs> also, if Thousand Volt members, uh, you get my phone number so you can text me all your crazy electrical questions, code questions, whatever you want. Uh, make sure you hit the like button. Like this video, because it's kind of dope. It's a good video, right? I think it's a good video. <laughs> I'm biased though. Uh, and then hit the, hit the little notification bell. And that lets you know every time there is a new episode. I have new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Stay tuned. Love you crazy people. And I'll see you in the next one.
best can to use it and video.